This video is intended for entertainment and historical purposes only. It's not meant to be an instructional tutorial or provide professional advice. Today, we're going to finish off engine number one's bottom end repairs. This means inspecting the driving boxes, machining new wedge bolts, and then fitting everything in place. By the end of today's video, engine number one will be a rolling chassis ready for full assembly in 2026. So if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and let's head into the shop. This is a driving box, one of four on this engine. It's the main bearings that the axles run in. It has a brass that's pressed in. This is called a crown brass. And on the other side, this presses against the wheel hub. And this is called a hub liner. In this case, it's Babbitt. These are lubricated with oil. Uh, they don't use grease in this, uh, not on these type of engines. Later on in locomotive technology matured, they had grease that would press on here, but this is made for oil. The way this works is that these are between the frames and they ride up and down in the frames on liners. They're called pedestal liners. Oil is applied, it works its way down both ways. There's a spring, sits up on here, and the frame member goes through here. And that's what the suspension is. Underneath, there is a little thing called a cellar. This is filled with cotton waste or, or wool or some sort of absorbent material as a pad. And it fits in underneath. And is held there. And the axle turns in here and it rubs on the waste, which picks the oil up, which is in this cellar. And you can see that they're fitted in here and they're fitted in here. And uh, you make these up in a, in a jig and a lathe and you press these in lightly, not too much. If they're too tight, they will actually spread this out and give damage with, with the box. And then to keep them from moving, so they can't move this way at all because they're keyed here and here, but they can move la laterally. And so part of the procedure is to put one or more pins in from the top, which is here down into the brass to keep it from moving. For some reason, whoever did this the last time put an oil hole in here. That's not normal. This shouldn't have an oil hole here. This, you can't reach this oil hole. If you can imagine what you're looking at from the engine is this, and you're looking at a frame through here like that. You can't see that hole. You can't get anything in there. The way this is designed to be lubricated is that there is an oil hole here and an oil hole here which goes down through the brass into the top of the brass and you can even see where they've chipped it out here so the oil any oil laying here will run in here and these actually act as reservoirs and again there's a cotton or wool pad or packing or something in here to keep the dirt out and the way you oil this engine is you can just see these corners the rest of it's all frame. And so you stick your oil can in here and you flood some oil in here and you flood some oil in here and you let it slop over onto this. Just generally make it nice and messy. The external oil runs down and lubricates pedestal liners and the oil runs in and lubricates the bearing. There's no way that you can reach this central hole. So I, when we got these, these were not drilled. They were, uh, they were, they just went into the brass and ended there, but I have drilled them through so that they will work. If we look underneath, you will see the brass has a groove in it to distribute the oil. The original hole they drilled is right here, which was a complete waste of time. One hole comes out here, the other proper oil comes here. These grooves are unnecessary. Somebody put them in, it's sort of a practice, and you can see that this one goes all the way through, which doesn't help much, the oil just drains out. Normally on a crown brass, there's only one oil groove and that is straight across, ending as this one does, just short of the edge and short of that edge. And the oil lays in here and works its way around the brass as it moves back and forth. When you hear people refer to crown brasses, that's what they're talking about. And if people are talking about hub liners, they're talking, this is now upside down, they're talking about a, either a horseshoe piece of brass, which is, can be bolted. Um, in recent years, I've been welding these in. These happen to be Babbitt, which is because it's a construction engine. Mainline engines, these were made out of brass. And of course, this brass, which isn't brass, it's bronze, 
is 80 10 10. It's now time to make some some adjusting bolts for the wedges on this locomotive. This is a wedge. It slides up and down at the back side of the frame and it's moved by a screw looks like this. It fits in here, moves things back and forth. For the most part, these are bent. The ends aren't very good, they're homemade. So we're gonna, there's only one that's actually usable. The other three, either I had to cut them off to get them out or they're bent and damaged. So to that end, I'm making up some new bolts. I started with a piece of uh, A36, one inch. And I turned this down to three quarters of an inch and I cut a relief in here, which is going to be eventually for this part. But it gives me something to thread into. And so I'm going to make up four of these. And uh, the first step is to, is to cut the threads. Uh, these threads are cut in a, in a lathe because there's not enough material here to hang on to to try and drive this through a die without it slipping. And so I'm going to do a lathe cut thread in here and then finish them up with the hand dies. So here I am. I'm set up in the lathe. I got the machine set up for 10 threads to the inch. I'm using a carbide tool. Uh, I use a German method of, of threading where I feed the tool directly into the mill, into the work. I don't use a 30 degree feed. And so we'll just proceed to cut this thread. I take fairly heavy cuts at first because the load on the tool can take it, but as the tool gets deeper into the material, I take lighter cuts. A36 is not the best material to thread. It has hard spots in it. Not the best stuff of the world. A good solid machine and good tooling is not a trouble. So I'm almost there. I'm just going to take two light cuts because the tool actually springs away from the material a little bit. They don't want it any more ragged than it has to be. So we'll just take two light, light cuts here. And there you have it. We have a rough thread cut. I'm going to finish it off in the dies. So here I'm doing the mother of all cheats. I'm going to uh, use the 535 to drive the hand threader on. It's not much of a cut, but it'll smooth everything up nicely and make a nice thread. You stop the machine a little early because it has a large flywheel effect. It's meant to have releasable dies. So I just do the last little bit by hand until it comes up hard like that and I run it off. Now you may ask yourself why I didn't use the dies that are attached on the machine. This machine could have done this just fine. The problem is there's not enough sticking out. It knocks up, locks up before it goes to the end of the thread, so that's why I did it the other way. So this is now ready to be for the next step to be machined up. Now I'm not sure if you can see this, but this is the thread after it's been run through the hand dies, and this is before. And it's a little bit rougher, it's a little bit raggedier because the A36 tears, it doesn't, it's not the best threading material, there's no lead in it. So I just smoothed it up to turn it into a nice thread like this. We're fitting the, the driving boxes and the wedges. And to that end, we've made up new 
wedge bolts. The other ones were pretty chewed up. They have a nice square end on to put a wrench on. And this surface is tapered because these bolts are awfully close to the tapered frame and they run into the frame very quickly. So they just fit in a slot. Their primary function, don't forget, this is upside down, so their primary function is to hold the wedge up. So there's an adequate surface here to do so. But you need a bit of a surface to be able to pull them back down. They can get stuck up there. So the other side has been fitted. There isn't a lock nut on it yet, but you can see the wedge is down where it's supposed to be. So that's this particular project all finished. Once I get the last one in, and uh, we'll move on. This is one item I forgot to mention, and it's an important one. When you're fitting the binders back into the frame, and you've got the wedges, you've got to make sure that the wedge is all the way down, all the way back to the binder. And it's not going to tighten up on you because there's been a lot of damage done by people thinking that everything's okay. And then they start to reef down on the binder bolts and they go down farther than they think. And it rigidly jams the wedge into the driving box and uh, it can break things, uh, damage the driving box, do all sorts of things. So if you have it pulled right up out of the way and you tighten these bol bolts down tight, then you can screw this down and adjust the wedge afterwards. So as you can see... Everything is in its place upside down. It was easier this way for me. This isn't the normal way you put wheel sets in. Usually they're, the engine's either hung on a crane or the wheel sets are on jacks and they're lifted up. They have to go in as an assembly because there's not enough clearance to get past the tire. So the whole business has to be assembled and go up together, usually from underneath. It's a lot of work because everything's heavy and wants to fall out on you. But I just did it the easy way. Uh, you wouldn't do this on a bigger engine. It's just you couldn't turn it over. But the bearings are in place. It's all pretty much done. Now what i got to do is block the wheels and turn the entire assembly over so she's on her feet. The wedges are adjusted. The wedge bolts sit up quite a ways. I'm conflicted whether to cut them off and make them much shorter. As you can see by looking at that bolt, that's, that's adjusted. But if you fell off the rail, well, the rail would strike the bolt and, and bend it. Maybe it's wiser to shorten it up. i got to make my mind up about that. I'm getting ready to roll the, the whole engine over and put it on its feet. Um, the problem is, is that these frames are meant to have the boiler in here supporting them. And they're pretty wiggly. They're, they're not very solid. It's a long distance from here to there. Normally there is a big heavy wooden beam called a buffer beam that's bolted to the back side of that and here. The problem I have is that this piece is off another engine. It's here, but it's it's the same casting number, but it's drilled quite differently than that one. As you can see, the frame ends about two inches back. This one, the holes were drilled really close to here, and you can't get a nut in there. So to that end, I've drilled this one to match the other one, which means this hole's pretty close to the edge, and a new hole here. Also, these are always bent because the core whole force of the train is taken on them. So to that end, I've made a couple of tie rods that are gonna go through the whole business and hold it rigidly from going in any direction. Later on, the buffer beam will help, but it's just wood, so it doesn't really have a lot of rigidity. Now uh, here you see my, my dilemma. The castings are correct, they're left and right. It's just that the holes are in the wrong places. So you can see that where this hole is, it doesn't line up with this one. This one here, the original hole, doesn't line up either. So, what do you do? Well, you have to decide which is the lesser of two evils. It turned out that if I used the holes in this one, the frame was actually sticking out through here. So we had to modify this one. The rods are through the holes. The reason for the recessed centers is that you have to get the nuts on the inside and everything has to be slid on before you put it together, rather like a stay bolt on a, on a boiler. So there's a a nut for each side that slides along out of the way until you can get it all together. Well, I'm putting things together, and just a quick note, the nuts we're using are 2H, they're double heavy nuts, really good quality. Nuts have a face that's designed to go against the washer on this side. This side is not designed to go on the washer, so you have to make sure that when you put the nuts on, you put them on the correct way. So here's the assembly, everything's together. The nuts are where we want to, and it's simply a matter of spinning the nut on one, one end, 
and tightening it up on the other to clamp it in here, both sides, and nothing can move. And then the time has come, I can't do anything more with this unit upside down. And so I'm going to pull it out of here, put it on the big fork truck, and turn it over back onto her feet. This is the last time she'll be upside down. Before I do that, though, I want to explain about side rods. These, this type of side rod, they're adjustable. The trick is to know whether they're too tight or too loose. The side rods have a wedge at the back on the front of the engine and on the back, the back of the engine. It's not in here. If the rod is too tight longitudinally in one direction, if you push this wedge back, if the rod is too short, it will pull forward and open up this brass. If it doesn't move, it's not too short. If it's too long, you go to the other end, knock this wedge back, and if the rod is too long, it will push away and open up this brass. And so when you do both ends and the, nothing moves, the gap stays tight, then you know that the, the side rods are correctly adjusted, which these are. So now we're going to turn this engine over and get busy on the top part of it. The engine's been rolled over onto its feet and she's sitting up where she's supposed to. Everything is in place, it's starting to to work on trying to fix up the motion work, fit new bolts and whatnot. The uh, the brake rigging has been installed. It's all underneath there. Piled all the bits and pieces on the back because uh, without the boiler, the engine's very nose heavy and it actually lifts off of the rear drivers with the weight of the cylinder up the front. And so to that end, I've made up a box and put everything together in one pile. So I know where it is. It's the back of the engine tie rods we talked about sometime earlier we made up the brake rigging we had a discussion of the brake rigging well here it is all assembled there's a cross member in the back that works off of this lever here and it puts the brakes on or off uh, these blocks by the way are in lieu of springs the whole engine's actually sitting on these blocks for now because i don't want the springs in here they're in the way for putting all the other stuff together so the equalizer's there it's in a vertical position and the long rod to the front and it does its thing up there. So that's the brakes. They hang off of the frame and they come up against the wheel. If you release the brakes too far, you have to be careful and have to put stops in because these shoes actually, they actually swing out and fall down. So they're designed to rub on the wheel. So right now it's not acting as a brake. You can see it's a little bit loose, but it's being held against the wheel on this surface to scrape, uh, scrape the mud and any crap that comes onto the wheel. And they just hang on this. And there's no need for spacers in here. I haven't fitted the cotter pins yet. You can see there's a hole there and a hole here. But you don't need anything in here. This stays, this floats back and forth. What keeps the brake shoes in line is this cut edge around here and it runs on the flange. So the brake shoe stays where it has to be and swings back and forth and everything gets equalized. And the brakes, uh, well, they're sort of there. I hope seeing engine number one back on our wheels is as satisfying for you as it is for me. Next time, we're going to head to the yard and get engine number two back on our wheels and ready for winter. But because of the holidays, there won't be an episode released in January. Instead, episode 20 will be out right before Christmas. Thanks for watching right to the end of the video. If you're enjoying the project so far, go ahead and hit that like button and leave me a comment. And if this is your first time here, check out these other videos from the series. I think you'll really enjoy them. Before I go, I just want to give a big thank you to everyone who's signed up to the Rector Restored Patreon or YouTube memberships page. Your support is greatly appreciated.